I want to talk about the Sadducees this morning. Because you cannot unlock the power of this passage from Luke without knowing more about the Sadducees. The Sadducees were in ascendance, they were in power during the Second Temple period, which is between 516 BCE all the way to 70 CE, when the Second Temple existed in Jerusalem. They were one of the sects of Judaism. We know of some, we know of the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Pharisees, the scribes, there were likely others that we do not have any written record for. But we know something about the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the high priesthood. They were the ones who controlled and served in the temple. They controlled access to the temple. If you wanted to come and make a sacrifice, if you wanted to come and present a gift, it was the Sadducees who were the gatekeepers. And because the temple in Jerusalem was the center not just of religious life, but political and governmental life, the Sadducees had a great deal of power. In fact, they were also the ones who oversaw the courts. They meted out justice as they saw fit. They had a lot of control over the daily lives of people in Judea. In fact, they were the elites, the rich, the famous, the powerful. Their religious beliefs and their social status were mutually reinforcing, meaning what they said about God also brought them great power and privilege. They went hand in hand. They had, in essence, power and status and wealth so that they could get more power and status and wealth. In the time of Jesus, the Sadducees had gained a reputation for being corrupt. Some suspicion that they were not on the level simply serving God or representing the law, but instead they were shaping the law, shaping God so that it supported them, a blessing to people like them. They had some interesting beliefs, the Sadducees, distinct from the other sects of Judaism at the time. According to the historian Josephus, the Sadducees rejected the oral law. In Judaism, there is the written law, the Torah, and then there is the oral law, which is the commentary on the law, the ongoing conversation with the law that is really at the heart of Judaism, certainly priestly Judaism, Pharisee Judaism but not the Sadducees. They rejected the oral law, that development. They were, in essence, fundamentalists. They liked the written Torah because it was the sole source of divine authority, so said they, and surprise, the written law favored them. There was a lot in the written law about those who were priests serving in the temple. So in many ways, as one scholar writes, written law corroborated their authority and reinforced their power in Judean society. These are the Sadducees. They do not believe in the resurrection, we are told in this morning's passage. They do not believe in an afterlife. There is no consequence at the end of life. There's just this life. And I suppose that makes sense, doesn't it? Because why would you think about an afterlife if this life is so very good? It's hard to imagine what more you could hope for. I am reminded about the joke that pastors who serve in Arizona tell about evangelizing people in Arizona. They say that the problem with er evangelizing in Arizona is that the summers are so hot that hell doesn't scare people. <laughs> And the winters are so beautiful that heaven doesn't tempt them. <laughs> That's the Sadducees. Why would you worry about an afterlife when this life is so very good? You don't want to go anyplace else. And so they come to Jesus, and they're here to test him. Now, whether or not you know it when you read it, this is a joke. 
This is a joke. The, the question about the woman with the seven husbands, remember that in scripture, seven is the perfect number, the number that means an infinite number of something. A woman had an infinite number of husbands. Can you imagine? <laughs> and so they say, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife, but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. Knock, knock, who's there? Seven brothers and one wife. The Sadducees are posing this question to mock Jesus, to mock him, to catch him maybe, because they want him to give an answer that will separate his views from the views of other Jewish sects. Or maybe they just want to embarrass him because they're asking an impossible question and he's going to stand there dumbstruck and not have an answer. That'll show the people, this Jesus, he's of no consequence. And so they ask him this question in the distinct framework of their faith and they ask him for an answer. But Jesus doesn't give them the answer they expect. He says to them, I reject your framework. Those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of a place in that age in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. In essence, what Jesus is saying to the Sadducees and all those who listen, that in the next world, unlike in this world, you will belong only to God. No one else will own you. No one else will claim you. Only God. Now, I want to pause right here. Because at the 830 service in the chapel, I went from here and riffed for a long time on God's great love. The one love of God in which all things are buoyed up and gathered in. I talked about God's great love, the bliss of eternity. I touched lightly on issues of judgment. I instead answered questions of heaven, and I left feeling convicted. I left feeling convicted because I was misrepresenting what Jesus is saying here. And I'm misrepresenting the importance of this passage from Luke. You see, what Jesus is saying in Luke's gospel is not some version of the U2 song, One Love. This isn't a kumbaya moment for Jesus, although you might have thought so if you heard me this morning. It is one love. But more importantly, it is one God and another life to come. Jesus' answer to the Sadducees is daring because it poses a direct challenge to their powerfully held beliefs. It is a direct challenge to the principalities and powers of the age, the Sadducees. Let me remind you where this passage falls. I know we're coming up on Advent, but this passage actually occurs after the triumphal entry. Jesus has already entered into Jerusalem, and in Luke's gospel, that means he is feet on the ground, and he is facing the cross, and he knows it. And it is part of the developing conflict between the Jewish and Roman authorities that ultimately leads to Christ's crucifixion. This is not a happy, clappy passage. This is one more step, one more nail, in essence, in what's going to happen to Christ. You see, they didn't crucify Jesus because he was smart. They didn't crucify Jesus because he was so nice. They crucified Jesus because he brought a powerful message of redemption that threatened to topple their power and control. Christ did not come to make anyone happy, especially not the Sadducees, and so his response is a hard stop. Jesus said to them, those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead, P.S. it may not be you, <laughs> neither marry or are given in marriage. At the 8.30 service, I softened this. It was early, I wasn't quite awake. 
And also because I'm only one month into this call. Really, last Friday was my 30-day mark. And I want you all to love me <laughs> and to be comfortable. I want church to be a pleasant experience, so you'll come back. I love having you here. But this is hard. This is a hard word that challenges those of us who are quite comfortable, who, like the Sadducees, find that this life is working out pretty well for us, because it asks more of us. Pastors love to quote that old saw, the gospel comes to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And if you're doing one and not the other, you've made a mistake. Now, I'm afraid of making you all unhappy, but more than that, I fear God. And so, let me say another word. The Sadducees have a theology that works for them and really no one else. It is similar, my friends, to the prosperity gospel. Now, there are many versions of the gospel, many ways to express the Christian faith that you can hold to and lift up. But the test of your faith, the test of your theology, is how does it work for someone who's not you? How does it work for someone who's sick, who's been abused, who has suffered terrible oppression? How does it work for them? And that's my chief argument against the prosperity gospel. I'm thinking about it, I'm talking about it, because recently we all found out that Donald Trump has a new spiritual advisor, Paula White. Paula White, who is a champion of the prosperity gospel and in a public setting, Reverend White, can I put it in air quotes, God bless me, Reverend White, prayed against the president's opponents and suggested that anyone who disagrees with the policies of this administration is operating in sorcery and witchcraft. Really? We should be handing out brooms at some churches then, I think. Sorcery and witchcraft. She is a proponent of the prosperity gospel because she is a believer that God wants to bless and prosper us, which I don't necessarily disagree with, but she runs it as an equation that says, if you are faithful, then God will bless you and prosper you, which is an equation you can only test in the other direction. If you have money, if you are successful, if you are like the Sadducees and you have power, therefore God must think you're good. It only runs backwards. What about the people who are poor? What about the people who are sick? What about the people that by no fault of their own have fallen into need and want and are desperate? According to Paula White's version of the gospel, that means that God doesn't like you. You haven't been faithful enough. You haven't messed with the Rubik's Cube enough to get the answer. This is not the gospel. This is a gospel that works for only a few and not for the rest, and that is not what Jesus is saying. The prosperity gospel is self-justifying, ultimately, and people cling to it because it makes them feel better about themselves and makes them feel better about the people they've decided aren't acceptable. I, I hope it doesn't come as news. People who cast God in their own image, who shape God in their own image, are not being faithful to God. It says more about them than about anyone else. And as I said, there are many ways of being faithful, but if your faith allows you to persecute and hate someone, you might want to rethink it. And if your faith, it turns out that God hates the same people that you hate, I want to have a word with you after service. <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi said, the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. That is a true statement. The measure of our society is how it treats its most vulnerable members, the poor, the sick, the infirmed, the children, the widows, the orphans. But that's also true of religion. The truth
true measure of any faith is how it treats its, its most vulnerable. Maybe James Forbes, the great preacher, said it even better. He said, if you want to get into heaven, you're going to need a letter of reference from the poor. Some of us, maybe even including me, might need to start working on that letter of reference. You see, the Sadducees came to mock Jesus. They came to make fun of this message he was offering, this message of the world turned upside down, this message that Luke's gospel promotes, which is the world as it exists now with the haves and the have-nots will be reversed. And the mighty will fall and the low shall be lifted up and every valley shall rejoice. God will not be mocked. The gospel will not be corrupted no matter how much we try. And here's another thing you should know. We don't know hardly anything about the Sadducees. We don't know anything about them because they have disappeared. The people who were self-promoting, self-aggrandizing, self-serving are no longer part of the conversation of faith. A religion that is self-serving, captive of the powers and principalities, is a lie. And as much as I don't want to upset anyone, this is the truth. And I want you to remember what the great preacher Fred Craddock once said. A lie will take you many places, but it will not lead you home. Another sermon. Another day. Thanks be to God.